I want to tell you a story, uh, the story I tell in my book, in a very abbreviated way, of just how do we come to believe what we believe about fat and saturated fat and cholesterol. So it all starts in the 1950s. Um, you can see that chart that's uh, on your uh, right. That is the rising tide, the sharply rising tide of heart disease in America, which was terrifying. Uh, President Eisenhower himself has a heart attack in 1955, is out of the Oval Office for 10 days. That is a huge uh, and terrifying event for everybody. And just imagine, you know, men are dying in the prime of their life, right and left, and this had not happened to their fathers. This was something entirely new. And it was really important that people try to understand why is this happening. Well, there were a number of uh, ideas about it. Maybe it was vitamin deficiency, maybe it was auto exhaust, maybe it was that famous type A personality, you know, you yell all the time and then you just keel over with a heart attack. Um, these were all viable hypotheses. But there was one hypothesis proposed by this man, Ansel Keys, a pathologist at the University of Minnesota, and what he came up with with what was called his diet heart hypothesis. And his idea was that you would eat saturated fat and cholesterol in your diet, so as meat, cheese, dairy, uh, and you would this would lead to your having uh, elevated cholesterol in your blood, serum cholesterol. This would clog your arteries like uh, cold oil, hot oil down a cold stovepipe, and would give you a heart attack. That was his hypothesis. Um, and it turns out that he was just a very kind of outsized personality. He was very aggressive. I mean, he was called arrogant and a bully even by his friends. And he could was said that he could argue anyone to the death. He was fiercely a believer in his hypothesis. And he was able to get himself onto the, to the uh, nutrition committee of the American Heart Association, which you see here. That was, at the time, the, really the only public health group that was dealing with heart disease. Uh, and, and, and everybody was following their advice. In 1960, they came up with a paper saying, we really would like to tell the American public what to do to avoid heart disease, but there's no data. Ansel Keys gets on the nutrition committee, and one year later, with no greater data in hand, he's able to get this recommendation published, which says you need to restrict your saturated fat and cholesterol in order to prevent heart disease. And this is the first advice anywhere in the world telling people to cut back on saturated fat and cholesterol. Uh, this is what I sort of think of like the little acorn that grew into the giant oak tree of advice that we have today. This is where this idea first became institutionalized. Um, so this meant in practice that you cut out uh, animal foods. Um, and I mean, sort of the easiest thing to imagine here is replacing butter with margarine. You replaced, it with, you replaced your saturated fats with unsaturated fats, right? So instead of butter, which is saturated, you have margarine, which comes from polyunsaturated vegetable oils. And I think it's harder to imagine what you, how you have vegetable oils instead of meat for dinner. But that was the idea. Um, and we just have to go back in history for a second to remember what were the original fats that people cooked with. I mean, vegetable oils came later before people cooked with tallow, which comes from beef, and suet, which comes from um, sheep. And they mainly, the two main fats that, that European populations used and Americans used before 1900s was lard and butter. Lard is from pigs, obviously, and butter. Um, and oils did not come onto the scene. They were, they were actually the first oil that was sort of used was um, whale oil that was used to, it was used to fuel the Industrial Revolution. Who, what was going to keep all those machines lubricated? They used whale oil. When they killed off all the whales, they started to use cottonseed oil. Uh, and then in the early 1900s, somebody looked at cottonseed oil and figured out a way to harden it and said, hmm, that looks a lot like lard. <laughs> Why don't we try to sell that to Americans to eat? And that was Crisco. And that came into the American food supply in 1911. And sure, and after that came ve regular vegetable oils. But these are new foods that used to be used to lubricate machinery and still are. Um, but in any case, Ansel Keys really won the day. I mean, the way to understand 
him is that it was a moment of complete panic in the United States. There was a demand for some kind of answer. He walked into this vacuum with a very strong idea, and uh, his idea became adopted by the American Heart, Heart Association. And he was easily the most influential, he still is the most influential nutrition scientist in the history of nutrition science. So and here he is on the cover of Time Magazine in 1961, the same year of that American Heart Association recommendation. But what was the evidence at the time? Well, it really amounted to one study that he uh, himself had did called the Seven Country Study. Um, and it was funded by NIH in part. Um, I'm just going to. So this is what it was. It was a, a survey of nearly 13,000 men and women in seven countries around the world, mainly in Europe, but also in the US and Japan. And he looked at, Ansel Keys and his team went around and they looked at serum cholesterol levels and they looked at diet. And you know, Ansel Keys had gone into this study thinking, I want to prove my hypothesis. And he did, in the end, uh, show a very weak correlation between saturated animal fats and your risk of having a heart attack. Um, and if you read, if you are unfortunate enough to read uh, 10,000 nutrition studies as I have done, I would say 90% of them telescope back to Ansel Keys' seven country study. It is the, one of the most cited works ever. And, it was, and it's because it was really the only study of its day and because it launched 1,000 ships. And he, so I took, I spent an enormous, inordinate amount of time looking into the details of this study. I'm just going to give you a couple highlights of its methodological weaknesses. For one, it only measured the diets of fewer than 3% of its participants, which is nowhere near a statistically representative sample. So it really didn't know what these people were eating. Um, number two, it was, um, it was, a, 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 a kind, the kind of study that only shows association and not causation. So it really can't ever prove that reducing animal fats was what caused the reduction in heart attacks. Number three, it didn't actually show that, that there was a reduced total mortality. So people weren't dying, dying of heart attacks, and maybe they were dying of something else. Anyway, I want to share with you one particular other methodological flaw, which I think is really more emblematic than anything else, which is that it had to do with the islanders of Crete. So these are the people on whom the whole Mediterranean diet came to be based. Ansel Keys looked at the dietary records of about 32 or 33 of them. That's the total population he looked at. He went to this island. He fell in love with them because they were just these, seemed to him ideal. They were, they had, they lived this life of a peasant. It was a beautiful, unruined Crete, not the hyper hoteled Crete of today. And, um, but it turns out, if you read the fine print of his study, that he went to Crete uh, three times for a week each. And one of those weeks he showed up, turns out he turned, he turned up during Lent uh, when everybody, <laughs> is avoiding eating animal foods. <laughs> so he no doubt undercounted the um, amount of saturated fats that was being consumed by that population. But as I said, ultimately, the ultimate problem was it was an epidemiological study. It showed association. It could not prove cause and effect. And for those of you who don't really understand what that means, I'm going to give you one quick example about epidemiology. Epidemiology looks at things that are correlated Many things are correlated. So here we find that the divorce rate in Maine is correlated with your consumption of margarine. So does that mean you should reduce your consumption of margarine to prevent getting divorced? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's what's called a false association. There are many things that are associated with each other, but they do not cause each other. Here's another example. People with yellow fingers tend to die more of lung cancer. We shouldn't avoid yellow fingers at all costs. What causes yellow fingers? Smoking. <laughs> so you may be missing the thing altogether. Um, and I want to say that nutrition scientists in the 1960s, they knew that the, the seven country study was a weak study and that they needed to do random, what's the, a, a, a more rigorous form of science called randomized controlled clinical trials. And they did them. Governments around the world undertook for billions of dollars in 
randomized controlled clinical trials. Um, and these took place, many, of the, I'm saying Australia and England, and most were in the US, um, but in Finland, in Denmark, uh, sorry, Norway. Um, and many of them took place in uh, mental institutions or hospitals where people were confined. And uh, these are the kind of experiments you cannot do now because they're considered unethical. But the reason that they're such good trials is that you control all the food of everybody in that setting. People are not allowed to go out down to the local bodega. They, you, know, you can see what people are eating. And this is different than the cl many of the clinical trials that you read about today when somebody, they're really just given a diet book and maybe they're given an hour of counseling you know, once a week and they're given a support group, but you really don't know what they're eating. So these were well-controlled trials. There were on tens of thousands of people. I mean, this is a very conservative number I've put up there, uh, the 25,000, it's just, but, but if, you, if you, depending on how you count, you can get up to 50, 60,000 people who were tested and experiments lasting one to 12 years. Um, and what were the results? There has no effect of saturated fats on cardiovascular mortality or total mortality. And this is uh, my summary of it, but I can, um, I'm, uh, there's you know, a Cochrane review on this with the same results, just no effect. Um, so Ansel Keys' hypothesis is actually the most tested hypothesis in the history of nutrition and heart disease. And we can fairly say that the results were null, which is they did not show him to be correct. 